In the last segment, we defined the two different types of chemical bonds, those being the ionic bonds and the covalent bonds. And we determined that the covalent bonds were the types of bonds where the electrons were shared between the two atoms. And they were shared between the two atoms because the electronegativity difference between the two atoms we defined as being less than or equal to a value of 1.9 when we looked at the product table and compared the electronegativities of the two atoms. Within the realm of covalent bonds, just because a bond is covalent doesn't mean that the electrons are evenly shared between the two atoms. Instead, one of the atoms can take a disproportionate share of the electrons from that chemical bond. And this is an important consideration, especially when we get a little bit further down the road and we start thinking about such properties as whether a molecule will be soluble or insoluble in water or soluble or insoluble in a particular organic solvent. That's going to depend upon, to some extent, the polarization of covalent bonds that are there. The polarization of covalent bonds is also going to be extremely important when we start to think about the chemical reactivity. What types of reactions will organic molecules engage in? Do we expect a particular chemical bond to be really stable or really unstable? When we start to try to predict those sorts of things, it'll be really important that we are able to identify which bonds are most polar and most nonpolar within our organic molecules. So as a result, we need to look at the concept of polarization of covalent bonds or that unequal sharing of electrons between two atoms. When we look at a chemical bond, technically the only way that a bond can be totally nonpolar is if the two atoms that are engaging in the bond have equal electronegativities. So for example, if we were thinking of two nitrogen atoms that were linked together in a covalent bond, this bond would be completely nonpolar because each of the two nitrogen atoms would have exactly the same electronegativity. We could also look at bonds where the two atoms have different electronegativities, and we would describe those bonds as being more polar bonds. And certainly there's a gradient here going from compounds that are extremely nonpolar, where the electronegativity difference between the two atoms is practically zero, to bonds that are extremely polar, which is bonds where the electronegativity difference is getting very close to that 1.9 threshold where we then defined the bond as an ionic bond rather than a covalent bond. So if we look at, and we're trying to assess the polarization of a particular bond, for instance, between carbon and fluorine, because carbon and fluorine certainly don't have this exact same electronegativity. If we take the electronegativity value for carbon, which we said was 2.55, if we look at the periodic table, that's available on Canvas, go to the electronegativity value in that periodic table for carbon versus fluorine. And we look up the electronegativity value for fluorine, which is 3.98. What this means is that fluorine is the more electronegative atom because fluorine has the higher electronegativity value of 3.98. The more electronegative the atom, the more strongly it is going to draw electron density toward itself and away from the other atom. So it's going to draw the electron density of the covalent bond toward itself. And this leads to what we refer to as bond polarization, where the electrons aren't evenly shared between the two atoms. Even though it's a covalent bond, so the electrons are defined as being shared, the fluorine takes a disproportionate share of those two electrons that form the covalent bond that we show there with the line. So in order to represent the polarization of covalent bonds, the way that we can do that is in two ways to show which of the two atoms takes the lion's share of electrons from that covalent bond. So those two ways are using a delta positive and delta negative sign, or by using a covalent bond arrow that indicates which which atom is positively polarized and which is negatively polar. So these are going to be our two ways to show bond polarization. Remember that when we say bond polarization, we're just referring to the electrons being unevenly shared in that covalent bond. It's still defined as a covalent bond, but the bo electrons are not evenly shared within that covalent bond. And this is going to be one of the things we'll zoom in on when we start looking at chemical reactivity later on in the semester is looking for atoms that are negatively polarized versus positively polarized, where the negatively polarized atom is going to be the more electronegative of the two atoms that are involved in the covalent bonds.
So our negatively polarized atom. is going to be the one that's more electronegative. And so in the case of our carbon fluorine bond that we were using as our example up here toward the top, we're going to redraw that carbon fluorine bond. Then. And in order to indicate that the fluorine is the more electronegative atom and therefore is going to have more than its fair share of electrons in this covalent bond, and therefore, if it has more than its fair share of electrons, it is going to be negatively polarized. We can use that delta negative sign there that I've put in in blue. So our lowercase delta sign and then superscript negative to indicate that that fluorine atom in that covalent bond is negatively polarized. If one of the two atoms is negatively polarized, that means the other one has lost some electron density and therefore it has to be positively polarized. Another way to go about showing this and I'll just put a triple equal sign here to indicate that these two ways of showing this are totally equivalent, you can use either or, is to represent which of the two atoms is positively polarized versus negatively polarized, you can use an arrow in place of that covalent bond where the arrow head indicates which of the atoms are negatively polarized versus positively polarized. So we need to put this so that the arrow head points toward the atom that is negatively polarized. And the other part of the arrow will have a cross on it to indicate which atom is positively polarized. So that cross there, of course, indicates positive. So it's indicating that it's positively polarized. And keep in mind here, we're not talking complete formal charges. A formal charge is where there is a sufficient number of electrons around an atom such that the atom is defined as having a positive or negative formal charge. We're talking here about polarization. So we're just looking at within this bond, which of the two atoms has more electron density, which has less electron density. So that's going to be the situation of the carbon fluorine bond. As another example here of assigning bond polarization, let's do an example of a carbon bonded to magnesium. So the first thing we need to do when we're assessing whether bond polarization is even relevant or not, is we need to define whether this is a covalent bond or not. So always ask yourself, is the bond covalent? Because if the bond is ionic, this bond polarization issue is irrelevant. So this bond is, spoiler alert, definitely covalent. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be drawing it out here since our theme is polarization of covalent bonds, but it's always a good thing to check for just so you don't get tripped up on problems in the future. So yes, the bond is definitely covalent. We look at the electronegativity difference between those two atoms. The difference is definitely less than 1.9. So we define it as a covalent bond. Then we need to look a little bit deeper to decide which of the two atoms is going to be pol positively polarized versus negatively polarized in this bond. If we look at the electronegativity of magnesium, going back to your periodic table and looking at that left-hand side of the periodic table, finding magnesium somewhere in that periodic table you'll find it there in the second column and we'll see that going down our electronegativity value for magnesium is going to be 1.31 carbon we said a little bit earlier was 2.55 and so when we think about drawing this out as an accurate representation of the polarization of the bonds here since the carbon is the more electronegative atom in this case, that means that the carbon is going to be the negatively polarized atom here. So we put delta negative on the carbon because carbon of the two atoms is the one that has the higher electronegativity value of 2.55. Our less electronegative atom is our magnesium. And so the magnesium is what's going to get the delta positive. And again, much like we did the carbon fluorine situation up top, we can put that triple equal sign there to indicate that absolutely these two ways of drawing are equivalent. And in this case, we're going to put the plus on the magnesium side and the arrow head on the carbon side, indicating that the carbon is negatively polarized here and the magnesium is positively polarized. So this is going to be how we go about showing the polarization of covalent bonds, or in other words, the partial positive or partial negative charge that is so when we use the term positively polarized, 
typically describe that as being a partial positive charge on the atom. So we'll use these two terms synonymously throughout the term here. Partial positive charge indicates that the atom is positively polarized. Partial negative charge indicates that the atom is negatively polarized. We call it a partial charge because of the fact that it's resulting just from this bond polarization rather than from the full transfer of electrons. The full transfer of electrons is only the case in ionic bonds, and we're dealing here, we define these as covalent bonds. So with that, we are done with this topic and we'll move on to the next.